So glad uh, that you're here this morning. Um, and um, just so you know, the diocesan guidelines uh, for COVID precautions has been updated a little bit. Uh, so stay tuned uh, in the next week or so as we kind of make a few adaptations to our COVID restrictions. Uh, but for right now, uh, we're making sure to still just be masked uh, indoors and, um, and socially distanced. Um, but please uh, stand and join with us as we sing our opening hymn. Alleluia, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, whose Son Jesus is the good shepherd of your people, grant that when we hear his voice, we may know him who calls us each by name and follow where he leads, who with you in the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of Scripture, and the children are invited to Children's Chapel. A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. The rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all were of the high priestly family. When they had made the prisoners stand in their midst, they inquired, By what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick and are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among mortals by which we must be saved. The word of the Lord. Let us say together or read responsibly in unison the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not be in want. He makes me lie down in green pastures and leads me beside still waters. He revives my soul and guides me along the right pathways for his name's sake. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You spread a table before me in the presence of those who trouble me. You have anointed my head with oil, and my cup is running over. Surely your goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. A reading from the first letter of John. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. How does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this we will know that we are from the truth and we will reassure our hearts before him whenever our hearts condemn us. For God is greater than our hearts and he knows everything. Beloved, if our hearts do not condemn us, we have boldness before God and we receive from him whatever we ask because we obey his commandments and do what pleases him. And this is his commandment that we should believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. All who obey his commandments abide in him, and he abides in them. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the spirit that he has given us. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to John. Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I've received this command from my Father. The Gospel of the Lord. I am the Good Shepherd, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. If you could not uh, tell from the readings or from the songs so far, uh, it is Good Shepherd Sunday. Um, this picture paints itself. We have this wealth of imagery, mostly kind of kitschy depictions of a stoic, long-haired Jesus with just a little bit of bronzer, you know, and a long, flowing white robe, heroically carrying a lamb on his shoulders, one hand grabbing the front feet and the other grabbing the back feet. Jesus as shepherd, rescuing the lamb, most likely that foolish, lost sheep. And of course, we often imagine ourselves as that little lamb who is laying on Jesus' shoulders. Can't you picture this all-too-common clip art version of Jesus? While there are many issues with some of our stock mental pictures of Jesus, one major mistake is that, you know, I'm sure most shepherds rarely wear white. You know, I mean, I struggle just by eating salsa, like keeping my shirt clean. So can you imagine trying to get those kinds of stains out? Separating this shepherding imagery from its reality or romanticizing Jesus as the good shepherd strips the power of what Jesus is trying to say to us here. The problem is that most, if not all of us, have never been shepherds, don't know any shepherds, maybe never even been around a sheep before. The knowledge we have of shepherding is probably not based in any sort of real experience. Living in a world so far removed from many of Jesus' references, it often takes a little bit of investigation for us to recover how Jesus' original audience may have heard his teaching. We have to start with the sheer weight that accompanied the use of this title, this word, the word shepherd carried with it a very particular connection in all of the ancient world, but also specifically throughout the Old Testament. It was common in the ancient world for a shepherd to be the illustrative example, the representation for kingship, for a ruler, the leader of a people. And Israel, in particular, had a history of referring to its leaders, its judges and kings, as shepherds. Before Moses dies, he says to God, God, uh, let the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint someone over the congregation who shall go out before them and come in before them, who shall lead them out and bring them in, so that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep without a shepherd. He's leaving them. He doesn't want to leave them alone. And so Joshua then takes up this role that Moses had filled, the mantle of being the people's shepherd, taking the lead of the Hebrew people. In Jeremiah 23, we hear a word of judgment 
harsh judgment against the rulers, specifically the kings of Judah. It says, Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. The Lord says, I will gather the remnant of my flock. I will raise up shepherds over them who will shepherd them. And they shall not fear any longer or be dismayed, nor shall any be missing. And this God promises to raise up new leaders, to raise up new shepherds for the people, those that will actually care for the people. In 2 Samuel, the people say to David, who at one point was an actual shepherd, the people say to David, for some time while Saul was king over us, it was you who led out Israel and brought it in. And the Lord said to you, David, it is you who shall be my shepherd of my people Israel, you who shall be ruler over Israel. David is appointed king. He is appointed the ruler to shepherd God's people. So when Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, it puts the current leaders, kings and religious leaders on notice. In, compares, in comparing himself as the shepherd to those who are the hired hands, these strong words from Jeremiah, woe to the shepherds who destroy my people, kind of hovers in the background as judgment against the current people in charge. Jesus, as the one who will gather the flock, makes a grand statement about who he is, about his identity. The choice of the word shepherd brings along with it all of this scriptural and cultural depth. Now, in addition to simply hearing about shepherding in Scripture, as an agricultural community, Jesus' listeners would have known shepherds. Some of them were probably shepherds themselves. They were familiar with the actual hands-on practice of shepherding. Our own agricultural system looks very little like the shepherding of Jesus' day. However, in the Lake District, the rugged and beautiful territory of northern England, some still actually practice a more traditional way of caring for sheep. James Rebanks is an a English sheep farmer, and he's written several autobiographical works about his way of life, his vocation as a shepherd. And in one book, he talks about how a shepherd can improve their flock, saying, you need to buy a tup, a ram, that brings to your flock better genetics. Choose him well, and he makes your sheep a better quality, more beautiful, and ultimately worth more. He says, so good shepherds are obsessed every year with identifying the tup or tups that will have an improving effect on their flocks. He evaluates a shepherd based on the ability to boost the worth of the flock, bringing more value for them at market. A good shepherd has an eye for those rams that will bring about the desired characteristics. Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. He talks about drawing in those belonging to the Lord. Jesus is building, creating this flock, obsessed with improving this group of sheep. James Rebank, the English shepherd, he talks about how this is an ongoing process. Something that takes shape over years and years, over many decisions, over the process of decades and even generations. He says it's not just the sheep that are handed down through the generations, but often the philosophy too. Ideas about which characteristics to focus on so as to retain the character of the flock. Fashions change over time, and flocks sometimes go out of fashion, then the shepherds have to choose whether to change their approach or hold tight and wait for their favored traits to come back into vogue. Beyond simply protecting the sheep, which is important, or doing the daily tasks of shepherding, also important, there's this part of the job that revolves around 
careful attention to the traits that define who the group of sheep are, choosing what to focus on, even if it's not necessarily in fashion. When Jesus says, I'm the good shepherd, the crowd would have been thinking about leadership, about rulers. They would have been imagining what makes a good shepherd, a real life one, how it would be a good shepherd. They're the ones who improve the flock, who bring about desired traits. But they also would have been wrestling with what Jesus just did. This teaching about sheep and shepherds doesn't just appear out of thin air. This proclamation caps the end of a pretty dramatic series of events. Jesus had just mixed together dirt and saliva, and he had placed it on a blind man's eyes, a man that was blind from birth. And he told him to go wash in the pool of Siloam to receive his sight. So when the regained sight of this man started getting around, making waves in the community, the Pharisees decided to investigate the matter. So they brought him in and they interrogated the man and they decided, you know what? We don't believe this. We don't believe that you were born blind. And so they called in the man's parents to corroborate his story. Eventually, the man who'd received his sight, he's getting tired of this. He gets a bit of an attitude with all of these leaders. He's tired of their questions, and he scolds them a little bit. And he says of Jesus, he says, you know, if Jesus, if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. So the Pharisees, noticeably irritated, respond by driving him out of the town. Jesus hears word that this has happened, and so he goes out to find him. He searches out this lost person, this lost sheep. And once found, in earshot of some Pharisees, Jesus says, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who do see may become blind. A clear shot at those religious leaders. The Pharisees realize that Jesus is directing this statement at them, and so it's here where Jesus launches in to all of this shepherd stuff. Jesus offers a pointed critique to the leaders. His words sound very similar to the words in Jeremiah, woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. The Lord says, I myself will gather the remnant of my flock. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. Like a good shepherd, he is obsessed with improving his flock. His desired traits, the characteristics he cares most about, though, are not what is in fashion. Not those that many would consider valuable. Jesus brings in those who are born blind, the Gentiles, those who are cast out, the unworthy. Instead of creating and tailoring his flock to what seems most valuable, Jesus brings in all. Jesus brings in everyone, seeks out and recovers the ones that others have driven out. The critique for the religious leaders stands as a stark message for us, the religious who are gathered for church today. Instead of seeing ourselves as those on the back of that all too common Jesus painting, the message of the Good Shepherd encourages us to make sure we haven't been the ones driving others out. Jesus confronts the whole system, one that would so easily discard and displace others. So I, I've actually been following this English shepherd uh, that I talked about on Twitter um, for a while. He posts all these fantastic pictures of his flock and this incredible Lake District scenery. And so out of the blue, you know, it's Good Shepherd Sunday, I decided, you know what, I'm going to send him a direct message asking him what religious types get wrong about this Jesus metaphor. 
I can't tell you how pumped I was that he actually responded to me. <laughs> um, to my surprise, he sent a message back. He said that ancient people understood what a shepherd was, and it was less sentimental than the modern Christian perception. It seems like his perspective leads us to changing that stock picture we have of Jesus a little bit. So I was just excited he, he responded, and I pushed it a little bit. I asked him a follow-up question. Um, I asked, in your opinion, what distinguishes a good shepherd from a bad shepherd? And in a very short but beautiful and direct response, he simply wrote back a deep-seated, long-term, selfless commitment. As we hear again Jesus' claim to the title of Good Shepherd, may you be inspired to have that same deep-seated, long-term, selfless commitment to the lost sheep in our world. The same love and care that Jesus has for them. Because each and every sheep brings value to the flock. Amen. Standing together, let us affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again. In accordance with the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. That we all may be one. Grant that every member of the Church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all priests and deacons that they may be faithful ministers of your words and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world, that there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake, that our works may find favor in your sight. Have compassion on Blake, Max and Gray, Andrew, Patsy, Frank, Brennan, Tim and Peggy, Ruth, Bill, Rena, Alice, Colleen, Betty, John and Patty, John, Sarah, Robert, Edward and Susan, Joe and Haiti, Paxton, Lee, Kimberly, Rod, Charlotte, Paul and Linda, and the family of Jackson Moore, and all those who suffer from any grief or trouble. That they may be delivered from their distress. Give to the, to the departed eternal rest. Let light perpetual shine upon them. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. May we also come to share in your heavenly kingdom. Let us pray for our no, own needs and those of others. Almighty God, to whom our needs are known before we ask, help us to ask only what accords with your will. And those good things which we dare not or in our blindness cannot ask, grant us for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Please rise. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Good morning. So uh, our vestry and our staff met together uh, for an all-day uh, strategic planning meeting yesterday. It was very fruitful, and uh, I think a lot came out of it. But one thing that I heard a, a lot in that was um, how much we wanted to recover this sense of parish life of fellowship that is such a wonderful thing about St. David's. It has uh, truly just a, a great sense of community. And so uh, we're, we're trying to, to bring that back um, as, as we can open up a little bit more for COVID. So I encourage you to come uh, early to this service or stay late if you come to the nine o'clock service. Um, we're now having uh, some coffee outside in that hour between. Um, also, about 10 after, we kind of move over here into our courtyard uh, for an adult uh, Bible study for our formation. Uh, so I invite you to come uh, for formation hour as we just, you know, kind of a low commitment, just an invitation for you to come and study the Bible with, with others. Uh, also during that time, we have uh, formation classes for uh, our, our young ones. So, uh, so make sure and, and come and try that out. And, and we are hoping to kind of bring back that sense of life and community uh, at St. David's. Um, also, um, on May 1st, Saturday, May 1st, right out here, uh, we're gonna have a hymn sing-along. And so um, bring your chairs and we'll come and we'll sit socially distanced in the parking lot. And you can pay a small amount uh, to choose which hymn you want Ben to play. Um, so it'll be fun. We'll have a food truck that will have, uh, you know, chips and queso and margaritas and all sorts of good stuff. So uh, come and, and uh, take part in that with us. Um, our school uh, is uh, one of the major ministries of our church. We have a, a fantastic school here at St. David's. Um, each year there's a spring fling, as many of you know, as a fundraiser for the school. Um, we just had that spring fling. It was half virtual, half in person. Um, and uh, so some of you have supported that in the past. You can still, till eight o'clock tonight, go on, uh, on the link that we sent out in the e-news and you can bid on, on silent auction items. So if you wanna, if you're interested in, in uh, helping to support our wonderful school, I invite you uh, to do that. So uh, I've been here, I think, five months now-ish, and um, <laughs> the, the diocese is now just getting around to installing all the new rectors uh, that have made a, a change in the past few months since COVID. Um, so on May 19th, put it on your, your calendars, uh, May 19th, a Wednesday evening, uh, we will join and hear, Bishop Reed will come to install me as the next and new rector of St. David's. Um, and there will be a reception afterwards, so uh, I invite you to that. It's not so much a celebration uh, for me, it, it is a celebration of, of this wonderful community of St. David's. Uh, so come and, and, and join in celebration with, with our community. 
think that's all we need to talk about. Um, do we have any birthdays or anniversaries coming up this week? Let us pray. Watch over your child, O Lord, as her days increase. Bless and guide her wherever she may be. Strengthen her when she stands. Comfort her when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise her up if she falls, and in her heart may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of her life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Happy birthday. Just uh, as, as a reminder, uh, currently uh, we haven't changed much. Uh, the diocesan protocols have changed for COVID, and so we'll be making some slight uh, adaptations this week for next week. So um, stay uh, you know, in touch with our uh, email communications. We'll tell you about how things are changing. One major thing that has changed is that masks are no longer uh, required outside. Um, so if you're wondering where everybody is, they were excited about the no mask thing this morning. We had a great crowd for nine o'clock. Um, and, uh, and so uh, we'll be letting you know uh, as we ease uh, some of our protocols, but just so you know, uh, the safety of our parishioners of our, is of our utmost concern um, and, and our priority. Um, for communion, um, you will stay where you're at and, and I will come to you. You can either stand or kneel when I come. Uh, to distribute the bread, and then you can return to your seats uh, after that. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb, who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, and the calling of Israel to be your people, and your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil, and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory. And we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. Unite us to your Son and his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ, and bring us to that heavenly country, where with David and all your saints we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church, and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. gifts of God for the people of God. 
Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you now and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.